السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد I'm sorry for being late a little bit actually I was coming in when someone called me from Washington DC and he was relaying a very urgent and important message so I had to step out and get his message so that's why I I'm late a little bit but one thing I noticed that when I was coming in I noticed that the lights are dim and I thought maybe it is because of the subject we're going to talk about which is jinnies so because a subject like that talking about the jinnies may require a, a, a dim light and a very you know uh, laid back uh, and a quiet atmosphere. When Hajj Khadija uh, uh, asked me to speak about this subject, uh, the jinn, I told her then you need to tell the audience, mostly the sisters, to be ready for a few sleepless nights. Uh, if they are ready, then I'm going to talk about that subject. I'm, of course, I'm joking. It's not that bad. It's not a, it's a horror movie uh, being produced by Hollywood. Uh, jinn, it is one of the most interesting topics, actually. And if you are average Durbonian, uh, you will definitely be so fascinated by that topic. Because after having at least 20 years experience dealing with the community in Dearborn, Michigan, I noticed that this subject is a very, very, uh, I would say, touchy subject. Uh, it's very common. Many people talk about it. And many people believe on their, you know, uh, on their own uh, projections about this su subject. So let us start with this question. Is there something called jinn? or jinnis. As Muslims, do we believe in their existence? Yes, we do. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in more than one verse in the Quran speaks about jinn. And the very last word, the very last word in the Quran preceded by, by another word that mentions the jinn. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوَسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ And that is the last chapter in the Quran, right? Surah An-Nas. So, the Quran does speak about the uh, jinn. They do exist. And when the Quran speaks about the jinn, Quran equates them with human beings. Just like in this ayah, min al jinnati wal nas, people, jinnis, and humans. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa ma khalaqtul jinna wal ins illa liya'budun. I have not created humans and jinns or jinnis, but to worship me. So in many verses, they have been equated with humans in the sense that they are intellectual creatures, just like the human beings. And it seems that they are, they are held accountable by Allah for their actions, just like the human beings. Now, we do believe they exist. There are many verses in the Quran speaks about them. There is a chapter in the Quran called Surat Al-Jinn in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about certain group of jinns or jinnis who approach the Prophet and some of them converted to Islam and became Muslim. Some of them rejected Islam and chose to be, you know, to disbelieve. Just like human beings. We have good human beings, bad human beings, faithful, unfaithful. Same thing goes with the jinnis. 
That's according to the Quran. So they do exist. They do. Uh, they are obligated with certain obligations that Muslims are obligated. So we understand then that as we are asked to pray, jinnis are also asked to pray. If we are asked to go to Hajj, it seems that they are also asked to go to Hajj. That's what appears from the verses of the Quran. Now, the question is about the possibility of humans and jinnis interacting with each other. Is that possible? Can a human being talk to jinnis? Can jinnis communicate with the human beings? Well, I see many people in our community who truly believe that that's very possible. And they talk about their own experience talking to certain jinnis who live with them at home. And some of those jinnis are called Salha. Some of them are called Talha. So the Salha means is a good jinni. Talha is a bad jinni. The good jinni can live in your house and would not hurt you. The bad jinni may cause some noise and trouble for you. So if you interview typical Dirbonians, they will tell you many stories about their encounters with jinnis. But what does Islam say about that? Is that possible? Is it possible that they communicate with us and we communicate with them? Just like I communicate with you. According to many Muslim scholars, many Muslim scholars, that's not possible. Indeed, some Muslim scholars believe that those, who, those people who believe in communication with jinnis and they talk about their own experience, their own experience dealing with jinnis, talking to jinnis, communicating with jinnis, they must be uh, unstable people, mentally unstable. And therefore, they would not consider them an authentic source of information about jinnis. I want to mention one thing. In Arabic, come to the Arabic language. The word jinnis, just the same one we use in English, it is used in Arabic. Jinnis or jinn. Jinn is the word referred to this very ambiguous creatures that exist in your mind and in my mind. Now, examining the root of the word jinnis will help you, will help me to shed some light on the concept of communication between a human beings and jinnis. In other words, if you examine the linguistic root of this word, it would tell you a lot about whether or not we can communicate with jinnis. Go to the Arabic language and take the word jinnis. And once you dissect that word, dissect it, how do you dissect an Arabic word? How? By taking it to its original root, to the past tense. So, jinni is the word. In order to dissect this word, we take it to its original root, meaning we take it to its past tense. So it would be what? Any clue? Janana. Because every Arabic word, once you dissect it and you take it to its uh, uh, linguistic root, to original root, cannot be more than three characters. Cannot be. So if you have a word, an Arabic word, an Arabic name, with five letters, six letters, seven letters, once you take it to its root, 
It cannot be more than three letters, three characters. Any, any, any example, any example. The word istintaj, istintaj, how many letters? Can someone count how many letters? No more. Alif, Sin, Ta, Noon, Sin, Alif, Jim. That's six or seven letters, right? Istintaj in Arabic. I repeat. Alif, Sin, Ta, Noon, Sin, Alif, Jim. Seven letters. The word istintaj. And istintaj means conclusion, to conclude. Now, the word stintaj, if you take it to its roots, it will be of three letters, which is nataja. Noon, ta, jim, nataja. That's it. Now, let's go to the jinnis. What is the root of jinnis? Three words, three letters. Janana. Janana. Keep that in mind. Now, let's examine another word in Arabic. The word janin. Anyone knows what janin is? Fetus. Fetus in the, mother, in the mother's womb. It's called janin, fetus. Now, take that word janin to the original roots, its linguistic roots. It's going to be what? Janan. Fetus. Take another word, majnoon, the word majnoon in Arabic, which is insane. Majnoon, if you take it to its, yes, if you take it to its original root, it will be what? Janana again. Now, I ask you this, and you are all educated. What is the common thing between those three? The insane person? The insane person, the fetus in the mother's womb, and the jinni, the creepy creature. What is the common? What's the common thing between them? Huh? Lack of aql. You're almost there. Hidden. Hidden. The janine is called janine because he is hidden where? In the womb of his mother. So he is not seen. The Majnoon, why is he called Majnoon the insane? Because his intellect is hidden. No intellect. No aqal. Now, why the jinni is called jinni? Because you don't see them. They are hidden. So basically, the common meaning between these three is being hidden. This explains why jinnis are called jinnis. Because they are hidden. If I am to talk to them, to communicate with them, then they are not jinnis anymore. Right? In other words, in order to be jinni, they have to be hidden. I cannot communicate with them. Just like you cannot communicate with a fetus. Just like you cannot communicate with an insane through a sane conversation. Same thing with jinnis. They are unseen. And because they are unseen, we call them jinni. This explains that through the human experience, it was not possible for people, for ordinary human beings, to communicate with jinnis. That's it. As they say in Arabic, nukta as satr that explains. Now, where these stories of people had certain encounters with jinnis, where these stories come from? They are fairy tales. Myths. So don't be scared. There are no jinnis here. And if there are jinnis, we do not know. I have no way to tell if there are jinnis or not. And anybody tells you he knows will not be telling you the truth. Because there is no way for us, human beings, to be able to communicate with them. They are from a completely different 
dimension that could not be measured through our physical senses. There is one more thing about jinnis, and that is in the medieval ages, they believed, and why I say medieval ages, because I'm coming to the contemporary time. They believed that mentally ill people, mentally ill people, are to be preoccupied by jinnis. In other words, if you see a mentally ill person, the mentally person, mentally ill person is embedded with a jinni inside him. And that's why he acts in this very weird way. Some of them, they even change their voice. I have not seen, but I have, I have heard from some reliable people tell me I've seen uh, a woman speaking in the tone of a man or vice versa. Huh? Possessed. They are possessed by demons. Is that true? Now, based on that, they would chain these mentally ill people in shackles. And sometimes they beat them so violently in the hope of extracting the jinnis out of them. Now, I, I just said that was in the medieval ages. Now, no, in modern countries, a mental a mentally ill is taken where? To the psychiatrist unit or to a psychiatrist to treat him. They give them medicine and to a uh, far extent medicine has succeeded in treating those mentally ill people. But remember, there are still people in 2015 who still believe in the United States, in Dearborn particularly, in Dix Avenue more particularly, who believe that they can get the jinnies out of mentally ill people. So the way they treat a mentally ill is by beating them so violently and reciting some weird, you know, uh, whatever, prayer or whatever, so they think they will be able to get the jinnis out of them. That's not true. That's not true. Because being mentally ill, all it means that there is some chemical imbalance. Once that chemical imbalance in the brain is fixed, the person could be, you know, back to normal. To believe that a jinni is... And by the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow this to happen. Allah would not allow a jinni to preoccupy and to, for a human being to be obsessed with a jinni. Allah would not allow that. Why? Because as human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us what? The free will. And based on our free will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would hold us accountable. If I'm supposed to be possessed with a demon, that means whatever action I commit, it is beyond my control. If I kill someone, if I murder someone, if someone rapes someone, then why we blame them? They are possessed by the jinnis. And that's not logical at all. We don't believe in that. Every person is responsible for his or her action. There is nothing called possession by the shaitan. Yes, or by the jinn. Yes, we could be tempted. We could be tempted by the shaitan. And there are many verses in the Quran that speaks about temptation of the shaitan. People who have been you know, controlled by shaitan. But remember, those people who are controlled by shaitan, it was with their own choice. Because they wanted to fall victim. In other words, 
By my weakness, my own weakness, I allow the shaitan to control me. Otherwise, Allah says, In ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. My true servant, you have no, Allah is talking to the shaitan. You have no control over them. If I have strong faith, shaitan cannot influence me, cannot affect me, cannot control me. Shaitan only can influence me and can control me when I'm so weak. When I'm so weak, vulnerable, and that's the time that I can fall victim of shaitan's temptation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did give you, did give me the ability to resist shaitan's uh, temptation. Allah did give us. But sometimes we, through our own action, we become weak. We don't care. We allow the shaitan to control us and to direct us to the direction he wants us to follow. So back to the subject, and I will open the door for Q&A. Let's separate between myths and facts. Jinns do exist, and there are good jinns, there are bad jinns, there are heavenly jinns, there are hellish jinns, just like a human beings. Jinns are beings, creatures that are held accountable before Allah, since Allah has given them the power of intellect. Jinns are not physical beings, meaning we cannot see them, nor we can, when I say we, I mean we, the normal human beings. We cannot communicate with them. We cannot communicate with them. Maybe the Prophet can. The Prophet or one of our revered Imams, when I say Imams, please don't get confused. I'm not talking about local shiuch. I'm talking about the 12 Imams, our 12 revered Imams, alayhum salam, infallible Imams. Maybe they have the power to communicate, but you and I and ordinary people, definitely we don't have that power. Having this fascination with jinn, had opened the door for, uh, I would say, for uh, exploitation. Meaning, since some people are fascinated by jinn, and they believe that it is possible for us human beings to communicate with them, when I'm desperate, I look for any answer. Even if it's a false answer. I go to someone who will tell me, you know why? You know why you are depressed? Why I'm depressed? Because there is a jinni in your brain. And I will help you to get that jinni out of your brain. And because I am desperate and I'm helpless, or I think I am helpless, okay, fine. What does it require? It requires to pay $550. It requires you buy some bukhur. What is bukhur in English? The herb, the scented herb. And it requires uh, this and that. And then they fool these people by telling them, you know what, I got the jinnis uh, outside of your body, you're okay. I will conclude with this story. Ibn Sina, or Avi Sinai, he is one of the most prominent scientists in the human history. He lived over 1,000 years ago. He is Muslim, he is Arab, he has written so many books. They believe he was the most brilliant doctor of his time. Very brilliant. Abi Sinai was a philosopher and a doctor at the same time. 
Because if you read the ancient philosophy, the ancient philosophy covered two other topics, logic and what? Medicine. So philosophers were doctors as well. So Avicenna was a doctor and a philosopher. There was a lady who was going to get married. In the night of her wedding, she turned insane. She turned insane. Just two hours before the wedding starts, she turned insane. And now there was a big in the family, among the family. They are ready to receive the guests. There are hundreds of invitees. And the celebration is about to start. And all of a sudden, the, the arus, the bride, became insane. Majnuna. So the family of the arus, they decided to seek help from Ibn Sina. They went to him. He came over. Ibn Sina is a very, very smart person. Very smart person. And he would not use the conventional ways of treatment. He uses his own way, of course, applying his own brilliance. So he knew something wrong. Why? Listen to me, why a girl in the Middle East, very conservative Middle East, would turn crazy, insane, an hour or two before her wedding? Isn't something that you would, yes. She doesn't want to get married in the first place. Ahsant. So, very smart. He was extremely smart. He asked that you all leave the room. I need to talk to her. They all left the room. Now Ibn Sina is with the Arus. He looks at her and he says, you know what? I'm not your family member. I am Abi Sina. I know you're not crazy. You're not insane. Just tell me what is, what's your story. And I will help you get out of your predicament. In the beginning, she continues to act crazy. But then, he would pressure her, don't play game with me. If you want to play game with me, I'm going to leave right now, and God knows what's going to happen to you. If you want me to help you, I will help you. But you need to be honest with me. Why are you acting this way? She started talking. She says, you know what? I lost my virgin. In one or two hours, my husband will know. And that's why I pretended I'm insane. Can you help me? Ibn Sina says, yes, I can help you. Okay. He comes out of the room. Everybody is waiting at the room, at the door, to see if Ibn Sina can save this woman, and turn her back to normal. Ibn Sina says, guys, I found out the problem. She is possessed by a jinni. And it took me one hour to talk to the jinni inside her. And I finally convinced him to come out of her body. And he agreed with me to come out. But there remains one bigger problem. Where he comes out from. If he comes out of her eyes, her eyes will be damaged completely. He can come out of her ears, but then there will be damage. He can come out of her nose, but then there will be a permanent damage. There is only one way for her to come out without a big damage, and you know what. The only damage is she will lose the hymen. So you guys tell me, what should I do? I need to go back to the room and ask the Jimmy to come out. You tell me, where do I tell him to come out from? 
So they all said, well, she's going to lose her hymen in two hours, so let's let him come out of the, you know. He comes, he pretends that he's yelling at the jinni, and he asks the jinni to come out, and the jinni comes out, alhamdulillah, safe and sound, and the woman is back to normal. And people were cheering her uh, treatment for becoming, you know, uh, okay, and they resumed the activity for the wedding. She got married. The point I'm trying to make is Ibn Sina was a smart person. He knew, he knew what you and I know now in 2015 when people did not know. In other words, it preceded his time. He knew that this is all nonsense to say a person is possessed with jinnis. There is no such a thing. These are fairy tales. And trust me, my dear brothers and sisters, when I say this, this is not an issue that exists in our history only. It exists now. Many, many people think the same way. And you may ask me, what's the big deal? Let them believe in, in the jinnis. If it was only believing in the existence of jinni and our ability to communicate, that would be fine. The problem is that there are some crooks in the community who deceive these people, who tell them, pay me $500, I'll get the jinni out of you. Rather, for this person to go to a doctor and seek med medical treatment, especially with mental disorders, especially with mental disorders, I said this a while ago. Depression is a stigma in our community, unfortunately. It's a taboo. We don't talk about it. It's a You shouldn't talk about it. We should not talk about it. So a person suffering from depression, what does, they, does he do? He goes around looking for, you know, weird ways to get rid of his or her depression. One way is to go to a crook somewhere in our community, paying him lots of money. And I know some other stories I cannot share here on the podium on what these people do, those crooks in Dirbon do to exploit their victims by implying that they are in connection with jinns. And if you do not cooperate with me as a patient, the jinnis will come after you. So, and most victims are female, trust me. They fall victim, and they sometimes succumb to their sick demands for the fear that if I don't, you know, hell will let loose, and jinnis will come after me. We need to be more educated. No jinni will come after you. If someone tells you this, they are lying to you. They are trying to deceive you. No jinnis will come after you. Jinnis have their own world, and we have our own world. They have their own sphere. We have our own sphere. We do not, we hardly uh, overlap. Yes, Hajja Khadija. Yes, yes, yes. Prophet Sulaiman was one of the prophets who had command over jinnis. Meaning, just, he, just as he commanded the human beings were soldiers, he had jinni soldiers in his army. So when he was about to, for example, a, a, a mansion, he would use both human and jinni workers to build his, his uh, mansion. Indeed, the Quran says, فَلَمَّا قَضَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَوْتِ مَا دَلَّهُمْ عَلَى مَوْتِهِ إِلَّا دَابَّةُ الْأَرْضِ تَأْكُلُ مِنْ مِنْ سِئَتِهِ 
فلما خر تبينت الجن أن لو كانوا يعلمون الغيب ما لبثوا في العذاب المهين Allah says when we decided to take his soul how did Allah take his soul? Allah took his soul while he was overlooking the palace hundreds of workers and they were working in three shifts eight hours each just like Ford Motor Company so they were working in three shifts to build that huge mansion he was building in Palestine that particular shift was mostly jinnis. Jinnis were building. So when he died, he was relying on his cane. He stayed relying on his cane for three days. Those jinnis working down, they did not know that he's dead. Three days later, when the termite ate his stick, he lost his balance because he's dead. He fell down. Then the jinnis realized, he was dead for three days and we were working so hard. If we knew that he had died three days ago, we'd have stopped working. But is this possible for every person? No. I said, I said, a prophet can. And don't forget, Suleiman was a prophet. Not only he was able to communicate with jinnis, he was able to communicate with birds, with birds. How? Allah says he talked. Did he talk to them uh, through a, a, an uttered language? Sign language? God doesn't mention that. God does not mention. But what we understand from the Quran that he was able to com somehow communicate with the birds. And the story of the hudhud, the, what do they call it in English? Huh? Not owl, no. Uh, hudhud is uh, it's a bird it's a bird no no if you allow me to check my dictionary I will tell you what hudhud is so it's a bird it's mentioned in the Quran in surat uh, in Namil so hudhud it says uh, it says lal l u l l i'm sorry pokal Anyone, this is the image of the hudhud. That's the image of the hudhud in Arabic. So I don't know what. Again, Haj Ali. H O O P O P. H O O P O P. Ho po. So uh, to answer your question, Haj Khadija, uh, you said. Yes, you said that in the, in the Quran, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Prophet Sulaiman being in, uh, able to communicate with not only jinnis, but also with, with birds as well and certain animals. He would hear what the ant says, and that's how he hears her telling her flocks that let's go inside our shelter before Sulaiman uh, and his uh, army would destroy us. So, this is not affordable for any person. It must be prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah would give him this power to communicate with jinnis. But for me to come today and say, you know why? I have a way to communicate with jinnis. You know, there is another impression among, um, among many people that the jinnis know the unknown, or they see the unseen. Is that true? No, according to this ayah, this verse I just mentioned, 
Suleiman is dead for three days and they did not know he's dead. So they don't know the unknown. They don't see the unseen. That's not true according to the Quran. Any other question? Naam Hajj. Well, it's possible. However, as far as the huge stones, well, who built the pyramids in Egypt? It's not, not the jinnis for sure. It's a human beings. And you know, some people in the ancient civilizations were really very sophisticated. The Egyptian, the Egyptian civilization is very, was very sophisticated one. But regarding what you said, Haj Ibrahim, about uh, the after the Prophet, yes, we have a hadith that till before the birth of the Prophet, jinns or jinnis had access to heaven through which they would find out some news for, you know, that usually human beings have no access to. But after the birth of the Prophet, they lost that access. Well, what is the ayah in the Quran? Uh, I'm going to uh, recite this ayah from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is citing a few jinnis who would say that before, before meaning before the birth of the Prophet, we were able to, uh, we had more power, but after the uh, the birth of the Prophet, they lost their power and the way. Surat al Jin. Surat al Jin, Ayah 8. We touched heaven, we tried heaven. فَوَجَدْنَاهَا مُلِئَتْ حَرَسًا شَدِيدًا وَشُهُبًا We found heaven is filled with guards, حَرَسًا شَدِيدًا Powerful guards, meaning angels, وَشُهُبًا شُهُبًا uh, No, mid, uh, mediators? Meteors, yes. So basically, basically, the Quran indicates that those jinnis had more access, had more power before till the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, they lost that power. And they no longer were able to extract news from heaven about what happens to people on earth. So according to that ayah in the Quran. I see uh, a pizza is ready. 
So for, yes, brother. Because Allah gave you that free will, you have, you have the power to decide whether you should follow the That's true. Or not. Nafs, that's true. Your biggest enemy is your tempting soul. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I agree. I agree. There are some jinnis who would be, uh, you know, overwhelmed with the tricks of a humans. I want to add one more thing, even though I'm not a doctor. So you would say, say it today, acted like a doctor. But for those who say, who, who say we have seen these things with our own eyes, meaning a human being talking in the tone of a woman, or some people, you know, they are not liars. They are not liars. They are honest people. They tell you, we did see something. And they are not lying. So how do we explain that? If they truly, they have seen something. And we know them. They are good people, pious people. They don't intentionally lie. How do we explain this phenomenon? of some mysterious things that they are experiencing or seeing. How do we explain that? I asked some doctors, good doctors, and their answer was, this is delusion. Sometime our senses go wrong, and we see things that they don't exist. We hear things that do not exist. And that's a fact. That's a fact that many people, certain uh, during certain time of their, uh, you know, when you are not fully alert, when you are about to sleep or you had just uh, awakened, sometimes your senses could be weakened, your five senses. Uh, some elderly people. So sometimes they, you know, could be, they could be delusional. They see things that they, they, it, does, it does not exist. Or they hear things that they, it does not exist. Not that they are lying. Not that they are lying. They just hear things that do not exist. That's true. Well, Hajj Ibrahim is bringing a valid point. Uh, I promise to be short, but just give me two more minutes, and I ask those sisters who are text messaging 
their friends at home to just give me two more, mis two more minutes. Um, uh, listen, when we pray, we get distracted. How many of you get distracted when you pray? Once a year, once a month. You're not being honest. Trust me, you're not being honest. If you were all honest, you would all raise your hands, including myself. So be honest and tell me how many times you get distracted. Once a month, once a year. Every day. Every prayer, ahsanti. Does that mean we're bad people? Some people are afraid if they admit, oh, I'm a bad person. No. Indeed, that is an indication you're a good person. Why? Because shaitan does not go after bad people. It's a waste of time. Why would go after bad people? Bad people are already with me. Shaitan will go after good people to recruit them to his camp. Shaitan will not go after bad people because they are already in his camp. He would come after you to recruit you. How would he do that? One way is to distract you during salah. One weapon that the shaitan has is waswasa, which is whispering. To whisper in your brain. You're praying. You just started your prayer. You just said, Allahu Akbar. You're ready, and all of a sudden, your mind is roaming. You're thinking about the exam you will have tomorrow. You may think, if you're hungry, about the mjaddara your mother is cooked, how well it is cooked. Or if you're in love, you're thinking about your lover. How is he doing? Is he talking to another woman or he's not? And so on and so forth. If, if you're a business person and have a gas station, you're worried if your gas station is being robbed now. So that's how the shaitan comes to you. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. The shaitan waits for the right moment. And what is the right moment? It is the moment that requires some concentration. He comes to you to distract you. That does not mean you're a bad person. All what we need to do is to resist. One way to resist is every time you start your salah, before saying, after saying Allahu Akbar, and before saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, what do you say? A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Allah says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ القرآن, When you read Qur'an, what Qur'an? The Salah. Because when you pray, you read the Qur'an. Immediately, you recite Fatiha, right? So Allah says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Every time you start your Salah, after saying Allahu Akbar, before saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ This helps you. And it also requires some exercise. Exercise. I need to exercise. And this is, sometimes you exercise through your muscles. Sometimes you exercise through concentrating. Thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, sorry for the delay tonight.